you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this with well, you. Well, thank you for doing this. Very excited to talk to you. Okay. Um, yeah, we have so Why is there an ominous tone there? Anyway, okay. Yes, ominous. And make sure you write good questions on those cards. We want them real long and really wonky. Okay. Um, now you, we know each other a little bit. I just learned that we're basically neighbors. Yeah. And one of my neighbors is in the audience here tonight. Hello, Jack. Okay. Um, but we know each other a little bit because you've been on my show a number of times. But not with you. Not but. with me, but most especially in a piece uh, on the subject of Arthur Laffer, who I know you must just admire so greatly. No. <laughs> I mean, he's one of the more likable, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> sure. Oh, wrong about everything, but kind of likable. Okay. Now, this is your 28th book. What is wrong with you? What are you uh, doing? What are you trying to accomplish here? You're making yeah. us look bad. Uh, that's an interesting question, because I, I had no idea, by the way, that it was 28. It, uh, <laughs> I don't know quite how that happened. You just and, lost track after you know, 20. Uh, it's not something that you, you do collections of stuff, and then occasionally something big to write, and, uh, yes. and then textbooks. That's, uh, you mm -hmm. know, they, uh, in, in real life, um, you know, all of these books that actually try to change the world for the better is one sure. thing, but uh, textbooks is, is, well, uh, my wife and I are co-authors of the third best-selling Principles of Economics textbook, Fantastic. which is known in-house as, well. uh, known in-house as Economics 401k, so there we are. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> and you're big in Spain. You just told me backstage that you're, the, the Yeah, the I don't know what it is. In love Spain, you. they advertise my books on the sides of buses. Sides I don't of buses. know what that's about. That's glorious. Yeah. Okay. We have something else in common. The president does not like you. I learned that. The president does not like you, and I don't think you like him. Yeah. I don't think you care for him. It's, uh, I have to say, well, all right, you know, it, 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 it's so easy to make fun of or, or, or disdain or fear Trump, and I actually try to not do too much of that because other people are doing it, but the idea that amidst everything else that's going on that he would take out time to personally tweet against me. Sure, well, yes. I mean, that's, it's, a, it's a huge compliment in a way. In a way, it yeah. is. Yeah, I'm, I'm occupying a lot He's of... obsessed with you. You yeah. occupy a lot of his brain space. Yeah, rent free. <laughs> yes. Uh, what is, okay, what happens in a day? I mean, I can answer this question for myself, but he's tweeted about you quite a bit. So you are on his mind. What is a day for you when that arrives in you know, your life? I, I've learned, especially in these days of, of Twitter, but even before that with, uh, with email and so on, you yeah. just have to develop a, a, a very, off, you know, let, let it roll off you. If, mm -hmm. it, you know, if, if, you're, if you're writing and if you're a public figure, it, it, like, like yourself, if you're in the media in any form, um, if you aren't getting lots of hostile mail and, and people saying nasty things and calling you names, mm -hmm. then you're probably wasting your time. And right. so um, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't let it get to you. You just sort of, okay, there, there's another one. As long right. as it doesn't contain something that feels like an actual threat, um, right. then, uh, uh, nev never read the responses to your tweets. Never read the responses. You don't and read them. That's right. You cannot and, read them. And uh, and let it go. I mean, it's uh, uh, I, I, I look at the numbers because I want to be it, I want to be sure that people are interested. You know, sure. if you if you send something out and there's only you know a handful of comments, then you then that's that's a bad sign. That means uh -huh. you've been too milk toast. But the uh, but otherwise, no, I mean, it, it's uh, it, um, it it's not. It really doesn't, I, I think I can say this honestly, that it, I really don't actually feel anxiety or upset that at, at anybody, Trump or anybody else, saying nasty things about me. It mm -hmm. sort of just comes with the territory. It's great, it does, yes. I agree, that was, oh, that was a clap yeah. for me as well. You can't, you can't really do your work if you're distracted by that. If yeah. you're, yes. Okay, so let's talk about arguing with zombies. I read it, I loved it, it's great. Have you all, do you all have a copy? Okay, well, I'm just saying, um, when you began writing this book, did you start out with a certain theme in mind? What did you wish to accomplish with this book? Um, well, the, the, the title actually, it started, actually started with the title, because yes. that was the, because I feel like, it, they, so this, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of old columns and they're mixed in with a bunch of new material, mm -hmm. and it really picks up from 
about 2004, uh, you know, after, after the 2004 election and so on. And one of the constant themes that I have is, is that bad arguments just don't go away. They just keep on coming back. And I actually, uh, I stole the term uh, zombie ideas mm -hmm. uh, from an obscure paper about Canadian healthcare of all things, but it but it was so oh. perfect. Um, I would love I, to talk about Canadian healthcare with you. Okay, we have but, a lot to say. But but zombie, you know, the it's a perfect term. The zombie idea is is an idea that should have been killed by evidence. It's just clearly wrong, demonstrably wrong, but it just keeps on shambling along, eating right. people's brains. And so I, this is a sort of a, a thematic tour mm -hmm. of the zombie ideas that that distort uh, the way we talk about uh, our problems and, uh, and why do these zombies, you know, wh why are these zombies so unkillable? And that's mm. kind of how, it, so it's structured by theme, um, but it's, it, that's the fundamental thing. It's, it, it's about understanding what it is we're arguing about because that's, it, we, are, we, do, we do not have uh, a lot of good faith arguments in modern American politics. Right. There are things that you can legitimately argue about. There are people with whom I can disagree but respect. But most of what goes on is not that. Most mm -hmm. of that is various kinds of zombies and cockroaches, which is a little bit different. Um, and okay, uh, What's the, okay tell, what is a cockroach idea versus a zombie idea is an idea that shambles along, right. that lurches forward, eating people's brains. What's a cockroach idea? Cockroach idea is one that you seem to be able to get rid of for a little while, oh, you but then it comes back. You squash it, but it comes yeah, back. Yeah, yes. You kill it, but it's laid 10,000 eggs. You, th you think you've got, yeah, that's right. Okay. And so, yeah. So, so the, the zombies, and it's, that's what really, you know, so, um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, t tax cuts pay for themselves. That's a zombie sure. idea that yes. never what goes away. Two, give me two ultimate zombie ideas that you think are really front and center in our current discourse. Okay, so the, two, the, the ultimate zombie in American political discourse is that, um, it, that taxes on, taxing rich people does terrible things and cut those taxes and wonderful things will happen and everything, everything will flourishes. trickle down. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's the, and, and the tax cuts will pay for themselves. Watch all that money broke. trickle down to the right. people who need it. And watch, and watch the, Revenue gusher from the, sure. the booming economy. Um, then probably the the other one is that any attempt to protect the environment will destroy jobs and and you know make us uh, uh, there'll be grass growing in the streets of all our cities if we try huh. to to stop air pollution from killing people. So those are the, probably the two most important zombies, but there are others. The myth that taxing the wealthy will be destructive to the economy. Why is that? Why is that zombie impossible to kill? Why is that just um, impossible? Okay, this it's, is um, uh, Upton Sinclair. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Oh. Um, the, uh, <laughs> yes. There's a very, very well-financed uh, <laughs> network of you know, right-wing media organizations, mm -hmm. think tanks, and so on. Um, it doesn't really take... It, for, for billionaires, it doesn't take a large investment of their money to keep afloat a substantial number of people prepared to defend the indefensible mm -hmm. um, endlessly when it's in their interest. So it's really, it's all about, uh, about basically hired guns promoting ideas. And if the evidence says that they're wrong, never mind. Uh, that's not what they're, they're not in the business of getting things right. Mm -hmm. Okay, is the, ta is the Trump tax cut in your opinion, the biggest scam in history. Um, I mean, did you expect them to lie so boldly about this plan? I thought it was going to be hard. You know, even okay. So the Republican, modern Republican Party, has developed an amazing talent. Each mm -hmm. successive Republican president manages to make his predecessor look good. Um, That's an incredible and, talent. And so, <laughs> so oh. if. If you go back to the Bush tax cuts. Do you want to do my show? <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to trade? I'm going to write 28 books, and you're going to host my show. All right. But, <laughs> but if you go back to the Bush era, they, they felt at least a little bit of restraint. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't claim that the tax cuts would pay for themselves. They claimed that we had a budget surplus, which was mostly an illusion, but anyway, but that there was money to give away. And it was, it, so they had excuses that were not quite as blatant. And they also, of course, didn't have as long a record 
of tax cuts having failed to deliver on their promises. Mm -hmm. For them, for somebody to come along in 2017, after the Bush years, after the failure of tax cuts in Kansas, after everything that happened, and say, once again, tax cuts are gonna pay for themselves, mm -hmm. that's a, and for essentially every Republican in, in Congress to go along with that, uh, including supposed moderates like Susan Collins, that's amazing. That's a level of chutzpah that's really kind of hard to credit, even for me. Right, yes, I mean, it's done so little for ordinary Americans. They've basically, they've stopped talking about it. Yeah, they really don't talk about the tax cut. They, yeah. They, uh, um, it, I mean, you can, you've huge, I mean, basically cut corporate taxes in half. Mm -hmm. That's roughly the way it's worked out. And we've gotten, no, it, this, corporate investment is actually down. And so all, none of the money is going for any of the alleged right. purposes. It's just being used to buy back stocks buy and, back and uh, pay dividends. And so that's, sure. that's impressive. I mean, I, was a, I, I thought it was going to work badly, but they, it's worked worse than even I imagined. Oh, that's very bad. Yeah. That's, a very, yeah. <laughs> that's very unsuccessful. Okay, well, I want to talk about... Uh, the condition of the economy, because there are endless stories and tweets about how the economy, I mean, just from a single person, about how the economy, how great it's doing and how well the stock market is doing, but who precisely is the economy doing so great for? I think I have a guess. Okay, look, let, let's be clear. It, uh, low unemployment is a good thing. Yes. The fact that people can find jobs, it's a really good thing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, we, we've been heading this way uh, for quite a while, but it, it's definitely the case that unemployment has continued, you know, which began declining in 2010, continued its decline under Trump, and that's a good thing. Um, now, wages have not done much of anything. So if we're waiting for some reversal, some end to the long, long stagnation of ordinary workers' wages, we ain't seen that yet. That's not happening. Um, the stocks obviously are way up. Uh, you know, that's, uh, mo the, the vast majority of stocks are held by a very small part of the population. So that's really nothing for most people. Um, and it's, it's not, you know, better than not. Better to have some growth, but um, it is, you know, considering the rhetoric uh, during Obama's second term, the economy grew at an average rate of 2.4%. Mm -hmm. In the two years since the tax cut, the economy has grown at an average rate of 2.6%. Right. That doesn't look like the sort of stunning triumph that these people are talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's I, you know, don't want to pretend. You don't want to say that, that it's, it's don't want to make this into a, into a, dystopian economy, it's not. It's uh, uh, better to have full employment than to have mass unemployment, but it's nothing great for ordinary workers. Right. There are always, okay, we're in you know the middle of already a very contentious election season that started um, in 2014 and will go to eternity. Right. It will never, ever end. Um, dear God, help us all. Okay, there are always so many, there are a million questions about the fiscal side of a progressive agenda. Like how are we gonna pay for this social safety net? Obviously the most tenacious line of questioning most often comes from people who would never interrogate the idea right. you know, of a tax cut for the wealthy. And in your book, you wrote economic justice and economic growth aren't incompatible. In fact, we have had that before. That's Can right. we have that again? It's, when can we have that? Yeah, I mean, so it's all about the politics. I mean, we, we, we know that we can do it. Um, uh -huh. Look. Um, Describe those times. Well, okay, no. So the, for, for a generation after World War II, mm -hmm. we had growth that was very widely distributed, a much, much more even distribution. I mean, I grew up in that era. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was an era in which middle managers and well-paid blue-collar workers were basically comparable salaries when there were really, really rich people didn't exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there must have been a few, but they, they were not prominent on the, on the scene, um, in which uh, a quarter of the, of the workforce was unionized, and even though workers who weren't parts of unions were, were effectively protected by fear that, the, the, uh, that unions would come in if they were mal mistreated. Um, we had uh, you know, top uh, a top tax rate of 91% under that socialist Dwight Eisenhower, mm -hmm. um, and, and the economy thri thrived. But it, 
I think it's also important to realize that it's not just our own history. And if you want to say, oh, well, that, was, that was a different world, something, technology, blah, blah, blah. Um, look, at, uh, you know, look at European countries. Look at Denmark, mm -hmm. which has, first of all, two-thirds of the workforce is unionized. So unions in the modern Wait economy. Wait a minute. Denmark is a socialist hellhole. That's, That's right. I heard. It was really funny. They, uh, I got, uh, th there was a period when, for some reason, Fox News decided that Denmark was a socialist hellhole and yes. they were running stuff. And it just so happened that I was in Denmark at the oh, time. Oh, God. <laughs> and I was saying, you know, it's a real hellhole of, of cute um, seaside villages. These horrible and, boutiques uh, I keep going yeah, into. And, um, and no, the point is, and everybody has health, has health care. Wages are substantially higher for most workers than they are here. Um, there's a lot of support for families with children. And they do fine. It's not a poor country. They have slightly lower GDP per capita than we mm -hmm. do, which is entirely because they take more vacations than we do. To, right. Their, uh, their, their output per hour is exactly the same as ours, but they, they just take more vacations. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm from Canada originally, and I'm always intrigued by those arguments. I'm always intrigued when people, and they do do it often, conflate social democracies and socialism. Yeah. You know, uh, that, that's the that's the secret. You keep on seeing these polls that say that young Americans favor socialism. And what's really happened is that after all of these years of the right wing saying that anything, you know, if you if you don't want poor kids to starve, that's socialism. If you don't want uh, uh, right. if you don't want rich people to if you want rich people to pay some taxes, that's socialism. At a certain point, people start to say, well, in that case, I'm a socialist. Right. Exactly. I mean, can Canada's social safety net is exactly as you say in the book. It's liberating. You, I mean, listen, yeah. I live here now. I'm a citizen of the United States. I love it. I'm in this fight. Like, I love it here. You know, I'm not going back. But I will say, just culturally, people don't walk around with that 150-pound backpack that they, that's invisible, that they don't even know about, that's just like, oh, God, I hope nothing goes wrong with my health. One day, God knows, into the future, what could it look like? That's right, and, and it's helped, right? Now they, there is the, it is in fact the case that, at least for now, mm -hmm. that if you lose your job, you can probably get a subsidized um, policy under Obamacare and, and you can't be denied because of a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's something that we, you know, it's a recent achievement that we got it by the skin of our teeth. And it's crazy, no other advanced country is like that. In Canada, healthcare is guaranteed. Canada, Canada's actually a little bit by the st European standards, Canada is kind of stingy, mm -hmm. um, but it still has far, far more aid to families. Far, the, just the you know, the basics of life are much more reliably there. This constant fear that if you take one wrong step and you yes. plunge into the abyss, which is the the norm in America, just doesn't exist anywhere else in the advanced world. It's just not something that you have to think about on a day to day right. basis. It allows you in life, I think, to take a yeah. few more risks, to take an extra day off. We have there's a day off in Canada that's just called family day and it's just like, hey man, why don't you take the day off and hang out with your kids? Like, why it's inconceivable. Here, everybody's working so hard all the time. That's right. It's it's and it, it by the way it seeps through even to the elite, right? I mean, the, uh, uh, which is the least of our concerns. But it so happens that I think this general fear, this anxiety Are they level. Be okay? What? Are the elites going to be okay? Uh, well, you know, they're they're, they're actually not because this right. anxiety level translates into a, a general rat race feel to American society, right. which I think is our. There are a lot of things. I'm I'm very American. I love this country, but mm -hmm. there are that's one of the things that is really. Uh, something that's hard to explain to people from other advanced countries because you're so rich. Why do you live like this? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, wouldn't many of the problems here be more solvable if people just uh, paid their taxes? Yeah. Or if we had a robust system for actually collecting the taxes that are owed? Well, we, you know, Historically, we've been pretty good. We used mm -hmm. to be. The U.S. used to be uh, especially good at getting compliance with income taxes. Uh, but there's much more just plain tax cheating than there used to yes. be uh, because the, the IRS has been starved of the resources. Tax it used evasion, to do it. just full evasion. Just plain, plain just straight plain out evasion. evasion. Um, tax avoidance, which is evasion, but except it just happens to be technically legal, uh -huh. is a big deal. Um, and particularly, we used to get a lot of money from corporate taxes. Yes. And now that uh, you know the corporations have 
found that, that they just had their rates cut quite a lot, but even before that, there was an awful lot of um, legal, but, uh, but <laughs> legal but immoral, hanky-panky, causing you know, all the, the cor profits earned in the United States to somehow disappear and materialize in the Bahamas or in Ireland. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, um, so we could just by actually closing the loopholes and enforcing the laws we have, uh, that's worth several hundred billion dollars a year, and which IRS pays is, for a lot of stuff. They've effectively been gutted. I mean, people, yeah. they're, you know, I, I feel like we, it's a story that's come up in my workplace to do a story about how the poor, you know, the poorest counties in Mississippi are being audited at the same rate as millions. Oh, no, we're more, we're, we're auditing people getting earned income tax credit, which is to help the yes. working poor, uh, are much more likely to be audited than, uh, than, than business mm -hmm. people, uh, than wealthy uh, people, actually not necessarily, people with fake businesses that they use to shelter their income and make it disappear from the tax rolls. Right. So, and that's a deliberate decision. We've actually deliberately encouraged lawlessness on taxes. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your intellectual hero, Paul Ryan. Um, um, the amount of grief I got, by very, the way. Very, uh, very salty verbiage in the book concerning Paul Ryan. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it, it was interesting because I, back in 2010, it's the first time I wrote about him, uh, uh -huh. I called him a flim flam. Flim Flam Man, yes. saying that he was a that, that he was <laughs> I a, liked it. he was a phony, and uh, <laughs> and it was so obvious, and but the sort of Beltway media establishment has decided that he was the model of a yes. serious conservative, and he didn't want to hear about it, even though it was right in front of your nose. I think at this point most people have figured it out that he that he's always was a phony, but it just tells you something. I don't know could if be, most people have figured it out. I don't know. I mean, I mean we was, figured it, it out. It wasn't even, I mean, not only was it, it flim flam, it wasn't even good flim flam. It was so, no, it's it was horrible. so obviously the, 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 uh, the, the, the faking of the numbers was clumsy. I mean, uh, it's, it's so it's, dumb and it unoriginal. Offenses. It offends it, 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 it my sense. You know, if yes. you're going to be a crook, at least be a smart crook. Yes. He's got an incredible PR team, yes. is what I'm saying. He pushed through that terrible tax cut, yeah. and then as a final F you, stuck his tail between his legs and fled the party rather than stand up to the president. I do not like. Why has he been held up? to such great heights because he, he really was considered like the intellectual beating heart yeah. of the party. Why was he held up to those heights? People just want to believe that there are still people left in the GOP yeah. who are making sense? There is still, not quite as much as there was, but there's still this convention that the parties are symmetric, mm -hmm. that they're, that the you know, ideology is symmetric. Yes, there are dishonest conservatives, but there must be dishonest liberals that are equivalent. And if there are honest liberals, then there must be serious, honest conservatives. So there was a slot that had to be filled. Here is the serious, honest conservative. And what Paul Ryan, his genius, if you like, was he was able to play that part just well enough to get slotted into that role, even though it took you know, about five minutes of reading his actual plans right. to realize that, that he was <laughs> not, in fact, the character that he was mm -hmm. playing. But the um, but that was it. it. It was very, very clearly that people were looking for. There was, there had to be somebody like that, right? And in fact, there wasn't. But Paul Ryan uh, played to that part. desire. Yes, he looked. He was like central casting. Yeah. Look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, I assume that he's retreated, and then he's going to write a book about like I tried to talk to Trump. Just a book called I Tried, and then he runs for a president. I don't know. I, I'm not sure that we'll hear from him again, but who knows? What do I know? But, the, oh. but it was the most amazing thing because it, it was as plain, it was the clearest thing I've ever seen in U.S. politics was that this guy was a phony. And yet sure. every, the, I got a tremendous amount of grief for, for, for saying that, for saying it, certainly for saying it too soon. What was the grief that you got? Oh, just, you know, lots of angry uh, uh, op-eds denouncing me, sure. letters, uh, um, uh, if I, I, I go to very few um, elite dinner parties, but when mm. I did, people would say, why are you so hard on that nice guy, Paul Ryan? And, and you're like, well, I don't go to dinner parties anymore. That's right. I cook, now you learned how to yeah. cook. Uh, yes, I'm actually not too bad at that. Oh, good. Surprise. What's your favorite thing to make? I want to know. Oh, no, no, it's crude, simple stuff. I, okay. Uh, toaster oven broiled salmon is amazing. Okay, fantastic. Good. I like it. 
When did recognizing reality become seen as a liberal position? Anyway, that's just me. Yeah. I, I mean, but really. No, I think, I, I think that is, uh, intentionally or not, that is kind of a quote from the book. Yes. Uh, so I, and no, it, um, well, it's because you, you have, look, the modern Republican Party is a, is something new under the sun in US politics. Mm -hmm. I think maybe in world politics. It's a party that has been pulled off in this direction by a combination of money, cynical political calculation, and you cannot be a good modern Republican without denying reality. Mm -hmm. And so if you are if you're acknowledge reality, it, it used to be that it was about values, all right. If maybe if, if depending on how much redistribution you wanted to do from the rich to the poor, you could legitimately say, well, I'm a conservative, I don't think we should do very much of that. But nowadays, in order to be a Republican in good standing, you have to believe that tax cuts pay for, your, for mm -hmm. themselves. You have to believe that climate change is a hoax. You have to believe a whole lot of things that are sort of obviously not true. Um, and so if you do say that they're true, then I mean, just just right now, I, I, um, I've been seeing you know, screenshots of Fox explaining that John Bolton is a left-wing radical. I saw so, that. Right? I saw that. Oh, my head exploded. Um, okay. You have said, you said in the book, to be honest, I wonder whether I'm wasting my time talking about any issue other than climate change. There's a strong economic dimension when discussing the issue of climate change. Yeah. What is your role as an economist in contributing to that debate? Okay, so I'm not a climate scientist. Mm -hmm. um, I do read climate scientists, and I think I, I do think my bullshit detector is reasonably good. I mean, I know what, I know what, actual, uh, I know what actual science sounds like, and so I can tell the, the you know, what, what it, but the main thing is that what I can do is talk about how much does it cost to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. And there it's really clear that it's not that hard, that uh, um, even 10 years ago, it looked like it was manageable. And now technology has been our friend. I mean, there, there's been uh, absolutely spectacular progress in renewable energy. In fact, uh, so much so that really you know, coal, which is the single worst thing, coal is dying even without a climate policy because it can't compete with wind and solar. Mm -hmm. And it, so it, it takes only a little bit of additional government policy to make a huge difference in, in the prospect for the planet. And it's an incredible tragedy that we're not doing this because right now everything, everything except the politics is lined up for us to be able to solve this problem before it, it solves us. Uh, but I'm afraid that it, we may not get there. In your book you call it, the, the, in, in your book you say that there's depravity Yes. in climate change denial, and I really, I appreciated that. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, if you're, I mean, uh, take, you know, imagine a person, Let, let's call him Mr. Koch, um, and uh, <laughs> who has a, imagine uh, if that who, who, who has a lot of money, mm -hmm. some of which, not all of which, is tied up in the value of assets like coal mines that we should not that should be abandoned because mm -hmm. we shouldn't be doing this. You're, and you're not stupid. You have to understand at some level that, that we're possibly dooming civilization by mm -hmm. continuing to, to burn fossil fuels at the rate we're burning them. And you're willing to take that risk with civilization for the sake of avoiding some reduction in your, in your vast fortune. That sounds pretty depraved to me. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really where we are at, at, at this point in the debate. Right. You, uh, oh yeah, I think so, I agree, I agree with that. You began your career studying international trade. Yeah. What do you think of Trump's thinking on trade wars and tariffs? Okay, <laughs> so let me give you a, maybe what people don't expect, which is that, uh, I, I think it's, it's stupid, but I don't think it's all that damaging. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. the uh, um, international trade is one of those things that people love to dwell on because, for a variety of reasons, but partly because it sounds fancy and important. You know, global, uh, uh, global only, as people used to say. <laughs> uh, or actually, I, I used to, long, long ago, 
my parents gave me a sweatshirt that they'd applicate across a global schmobel. And I said, what? <laughs> and, and they say, because every time you're flying off to some place, they, and I, we ask you what you're talking about, I say, oh, it's global schmobel. Um, so um, uh, so it's, it's an exaggerated subject. Now, Trump comes in with this, um, his own version of this exaggerated view of how mm -hmm. important, it's not this trivial. The international trade is a big thing, but the idea that it's, it's the be all and end all, whether it's this in, immense force for good or this immense force for evil, as Trump thinks it is, um, it really isn't. So what Trump has done, I think, in, in a way, the worst thing about his trade wars is not the damage it's doing to the global economy, though it is doing some. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's creating uncertainty. It's disrupting supply chains and all of these, and I can start to jargon my way uh, all the mm -hmm. way across this hall. But the um, but the worst of it is that the United States is making a mockery. It, it happens that international trade is, is one of the great triumphs of international diplomacy. We've created a rules-based system, mm -hmm. not a rigid one where countries can never do anything, but one in which there are procedures, there are essentially international courts that adjudicate disputes. It's, it creates a, a, a degree of certainty. And what Trump has done is to basically rip all of that up and make us uh, effectively a lawless nation on when it comes to international trade, which spills over onto other things. So he's made us, we, we are no longer a reliable partner. We, everybody now knows that the United States will rip up its agreements um, right. f on, the, on the whim of, of some guy in the White House. Uh, and that's got to have spillover effects to everything. We, we are just not a country people can trust anymore. And how do you see that bearing out for the next year? Well, you know, it's... Are you good at... You're good at divining things. No, it's, it's really us. hard. What's, it's Okay. I mean, a lot of what's happened... I mean, I, the trade war actually has done, I'd say, more damage than I thought it would because of the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And the it's looking a little bit like Trump is getting... Uh, it, reaching where I thought he might reach, which is to declare victory and surrender. Uh, okay. So effectively, that's what he did on NAFTA, the mm -hmm. agreement with Canada, you know, the, created the new NAFTA, which is almost indistinguishable from the old NAFTA, <laughs> just right. stuck his name on it. And, uh, <laughs> um, and on China, although the tariffs are still in place, basically, uh, the, the, you know, re reports say that the Chinese are actually sort of uh, can't believe that they got away with so few concessions. Um, and okay. so that's a lot of what's happened. But that, then again, you never know what's coming next. So there might, he may be about to slap tariffs on German automobiles, which are a threat to national security, which no one can understand that. Mm -hmm. But that's a, but, uh, but so the, it, it, it's not clear whether there'll be another round of damage. Mm -hmm. But so far, I think we've probably seen most of the, it, it probably you know, shaved a couple of, a couple of tenths of a uh, percentage point of growth in the past year. Okay. Are there battles that you have taken on in which you feel that you have made a difference? Social Security, oh, for yeah. one. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Boy, uh, I can't, because of the darkness, I can't see the, so how many, uh, I think a fair number of people will probably remember that. So we had this election in 2004. I don't remember and, it. Uh, well, I don't yeah. remember and, it well, yeah. Uh, and it was, a, it was an election, it was an election that was largely about terrorism and mm -hmm. the, the illusion of victory in Iraq and also about gay marriage. So as I say, Bush was elected uh, as the nation's defender against gay married terrorists. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and then he immediately turned around and said, so I now have a mandate to privatize Social Security. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people thought he was gonna get it because you know, he'd been winning a lot of stuff. And a few people, uh, said, no, we're not going to do that. And so I was certainly writing a lot about this is a really, really bad idea. Yeah. Um, now, what I did pales in comparison with what Nancy Pelosi did. I mean, she's mm -hmm. really the person who saved Social Security. Uh, my favorite Nancy Pelosi quote, they asked, when are you going to come up with your plan for Social Security? And she said, uh, never, we'll never do for you. Uh, <laughs> but, right. the, uh, the, so that was, but that was a, a case really where at least, you know, there was a pretense that there was a, a rational argument for what Bush was trying to do, mm -hmm. um, which was good from my point of view because it meant that you could actually spend, you know, productively tear that ar argument to shreds. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think what, we're, what really, really mattered was that, and this is one of these things I'm, where uh, people talk about bubbles, and I, um, 
I think that people of upper income are in a bubble. They don't understand how absolutely central Social Security is to the lives of most Americans. Mm -hmm. That the majority of people depend on Social Security for the majority of their retirement and that a quarter of Americans basically have nothing in retirement except Social Security. Right. So you say, I'm going to change this into a system of risky private accounts. It turns out that people, basically the nation as a whole said, hell no. And, uh, right. But that was, it, that was, it was something, it was, the first, it was the first policy debate since I started writing for the New York Times where my side actually won. Ah, that's a nice feeling. Yeah. Do you feel like, do you feel sometimes that you are just shrieking into the void with your columns? Oh, yeah. I mean, do you, or do you, are you, do you feel like you're out there changing one mind at a time? You're just in there, just in the trenches. I think it's much more a question of providing people with the arguments that okay. may move stuff. So it's not that, thank you. It's not that a, there are a lot of people out there, you know, it's not that there are, there are conservatives who read my column and say, you know, he's right and, and transform at the moment. Oh it, my God, I never thought of it that it way. It may before. happen sometimes, but not often. Uh -huh. But you can provide the arguments. You can help uh, lay the groundwork for uh, that so that people do stuff. Uh, but, you know, direct inf you certainly don't want to exaggerate the importance. Uh, you know, only, uh, you know, how many times in my life have I told a person with real power uh, what he should be doing and mm -hmm. have him actually do it? And the answer is once. And, and the person in question was actually the Prime Minister of Japan. So, oh. uh, <laughs> Wait, what did you tell the Prime Minister of Japan to do? Uh, cancel that tax increase. Uh, okay. you, need, you need the economy to keep on building momentum. And uh, he did, and it did. Oh, great. So. Okay, well, thank you. Okay. For saving Japan. Okay. Um, which which uh, zombie idea has caused you the greatest red hot personal distress, and what does Paul Krugman look like when he's in a tizzy? Oh, boy. You know, I'm not sure that any of these really... You're just like, uh, I'm making my toaster salmon, and now it's burned! No. Oh, no, I think that the moment when I got really closest to being horrified, it wasn't the worst thing that's happened to policy or the world, but there was this period in 2010, 2011, when the great, re you know, we, we'd had the financial crisis and most of the advanced world was still in a pretty dire strait. Uh -huh. We had high unemployment here. We, there was catastrophic unemployment in, in lots of Europe. And all of a sudden, everybody, everybody, all the important people decided that unemployment was not the problem, budget deficits were the problem. And what we needed was fiscal austerity. And right. that was where I really was tearing my hair out because we knew that wasn't right. And it uh -huh. was really clear from the evidence that it wasn't right. And uh, we knew what to do. And it was definitely time to have, to continue fiscal stimulus until the economy was a lot closer to full employment. Um, and yet, uh, all the important people, including, I'm sorry to say, that even, even President Obama was starting to talk the austerity talk. And that was, that was probably the most frustrating era that I've gone through. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't smash plates because I'm not, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I'm a calm person, but, uh, but, uh, but it's a sort of a constant level of anxiety. I don't have, I don't okay, really spike. Okay, just like a vibrating uh, energy of yeah. distress and anxiety. Yeah. I relate to you. Yeah. Okay. Tell us something about yourself that we would not expect. Did you invest in Beanie Babies and get out just before the bubble burst? No. Like what? Do no, we not I, know? I've written a little bit about this, so some people may know this, but I'm, um, in my late 50s, I discovered indie rock. What? <laughs> and, uh, really? and, and so my favorite, my favorite activity uh, these days is to go to some small venue, standing only, I mean, I'll just get the best seats in the house because there are no seats in the house, mm -hmm. standing with a beer in my hand, listening to some young, really good band. I love that so, so I'm a, much. Um, yeah, as I say, sometimes I'm... I'm wow! Do you recall the last Standing Room Only concert that you went to? Oh, sure. Uh, uh, just a little over a month ago, because uh -huh. uh, I went to uh, Rockwood Music Hall and saw Rena Del Cid, who, which is, uh, I don't know if anybody knows, they're very, you know, just just on, on the early stages of, of their career, and it's a very sort of folky uh, group from Minneapolis and they're, uh, That's it was fantastic. great. fantastic. I was actually just reflecting to someone yesterday. I wonder what all of our retirement homes are gonna look like in the future. 
because I just think we're gonna need DJs. I feel like the retirement homes of the future are gonna be much cooler than they were <laughs> one hour. I don't know. It's yeah, a... you have needs. You need like you need you need you need cool music. Yeah. I'm not sure about the standing uh, all night with a beer in your hand. I'm not sure that I'll be able to do that 15 years from you now. You can but... do that. You'll be there. I'll come and find you. Okay. Okay. Do you have, what gives you, I'm going to move on to audience questions in one second, but I always like to ask the question of what brings you, what makes you feel hopeful for the next year? Because I think a lot of us are not <laughs> feeling that necessarily. Is there anything that you look to. You don't have to tell me your self-care routine. I know what it is now. Right. Um, but what, does anything bring you hope? And you don't, and if you, nothing does. Well, for you the don't year, I don't know. I mean, the year, God knows. No one knows what this election is going to be. And, and yeah. uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll be like this, like everybody else, um, right up until the end. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, the, uh, if you step back a little bit, um, I, I do think um, in a lot of ways we are a better society. In mm -hmm. spite of all of these things, we are a better society than we were. I mean, uh, uh, I've been at this for a long time, and it's sometimes hard to remember how back, even during the Reagan years, how much just raw, uh, casual racism, homophobia there was. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it wasn't until sometime in the mid-1980s that a that a, a plurality of white people thought that interracial marriages were okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, we're, we're a vastly more tolerant, open society than we used to be. And that's probably the thing that gives me the big, biggest hope. Great. Okay, I'm gonna ask uh, audience questions now. Yes, that's lovely. All right, these are already these are very good. I'm going to read them as is. Will Bloomberg alter the primaries or election? God knows. Uh, he's pouring so much money. He's pouring so much money, although ads. to his credit, a lot of it looks less like promoting Mike Bloomberg than promoting the Democratic um, mm -hmm. agenda as a whole. So, yes. Uh, I, I will give him that. And the, now, I do. I I find myself in rooms where there are lots of people uh, who who think that Mike Bloomberg would be a great you know, choice for president. Uh, but those are the, the the people in those rooms are uh, consist almost entirely of of men in gray suits with seven figure incomes. <laughs> so uh, so I, I don't I don't really take him very seriously as a presidential candidate. But who knows? Yeah, who knows? And he has pledged to take all of that money and push it into, That's right. yes. It's, it, it's less of an ego trip. I mean, it is an ego, ego trip, but it's not an uncontrolled ego trip, so. He's doing a Super Bowl ad, and we made a fake Super Bowl ad for him tomorrow that will air on the oh, show okay. tomorrow. Uh, it's very, uh, very good. I'll try to watch it. I think that he will enjoy it, and maybe, maybe it'll become his ad. I don't know, it's actually quite good. Okay, Bernie, not to toot my own horn, toot toot. Okay, Bernie or Warren plans, what is the difference? Okay. Um, war, in terms of, of goals, in terms of being you know, very progressive, uh, then similar. Um, Warren has actually thought it through. Warren actually does, does, the, does the, the homework. Oh, she's a thinker. Uh, she's not just a thinker, she's also actually very good at picking the right people. If you look yes. at the cast of people who've actually done her plans, it's amazing. Uh, Bernie is a lot more casual. His numbers don't actually add up. Um, it's uh, really, you know, it, it's, it, it, Sanders, it's much more of an attitude than an actual set of plans. Okay. Uh, now, okay, and I'm gonna get some grief. I get a lot of grief from the Bernie people. Uh, okay. Some, they're little, there's a little bit of a... a, 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 a I don't wanna start a fight here tonight. Let's not start that fight. Um, let me say that in practice, I don't think, uh, I actually don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, if, if any Democrat wins uh, and takes the Senate, with, if, the, if the Democrats don't take the Senate, then, then nothing happens. Sure. Um, but if any Democrat wins, what will actually emerge will be something far, far more modest than Bernie's plans. Uh, probably far, far more modest than Warren's plans, which I think she, she acknowledges. Uh, mm -hmm. That it's, it, we're not gonna, Medicare for all is not going to happen in the next four years. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, 
um, massive, a massive increase in government spending and taxes is not going to happen. Um, in practice, you're going to get something that is basically, a, a, hopefully, a greatly enhanced Obamacare, more aid to families, a, a substantially more progressive agenda. And that's going to happen, I think, with any of the candidates, because even the centrists are actually way to the left of where the Democrats were 10 years mm -hmm. ago. So uh, uh, my guess is that the, the actual policy agenda of a Biden administration and the Sanders administration would be almost indistinguishable. I do think that uh, it behooves us all to really practice getting behind one candidate. Uh, well, you know, New York Times rules, I cannot do I endorsements. Know. We are not so you don't know to. which party I favor. Um, New York Times, but, listen. But I can't. New York Times can't do an endorsement. Well, the <laughs> New York Times has, one. that's another issue. Good God. <laughs> I, I, that's I know nothing. I, I was yeah. not involved in that at all. <laughs> no. Um, no, but the, the um, <laughs> but no, I mean, the point is, uh, you do need to realize that on, on the one hand, if even if you think that the, you know, if, if you're a centrist and you think that the Bernie Sanders agenda is way too aggressive, don't worry about it. It's not, it, that's not going to be what actually happens. And even if you're a progressive and you think that Joe Biden is much too centrist for your taste, the fact of the matter is he'll be far more progressive, obviously, than the current administration, mm -hmm. and far more progressive, in fact, than the Obama administration was because the Democratic Party has changed. So it, it, you should, nobody, I think, who supports the general thrust of where the Democratic Party is these days should have any qualms about supporting any of the candidates in the general election. They're all going to be good. Here, here. Here, here. Okay. Have you any theories about why farmers, factory workers, and other blue collar workers continue to support Trump despite the fact that his economic policies hurt them? The, well, um, First of all, just you know, race. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, if if you nothing in American politics makes sense without without talking about race. You know, the mm -hmm. the, the original sin of America colors everything, mm -hmm. um, and I th I think that is uh, actually according to you know, the political science uh, people that that is the dominant thing. The racial antagonism is what predicts votes, mm -hmm. and uh, it's um, and Trump has sort of given people license to say things, uh, uh, believe things that they didn't want to before. Um, and then I th there's a little bit of also just a kind of, um, uh, the pe people want someone who, yeah, so it's another old line, right? For to any complex problem, there is a, a solution that is simple, clear, and wrong. And uh, Trump, is, uh, <laughs> Trump is, is full of that kind of thing. And uh, so, and, and it, takes a, it takes quite a while. I mean, uh, it, the fact of the matter is that manufacturing, it's, it's odd that the, the very things that Trump said he was going to really help are the th parts of the economy that are doing worse. So the, hmm. the, the economy as a whole is, is, you know, pretty good employment, but manufacturing employment is declining. Uh, the, um, uh, so he hasn't actually managed to bring that in. Now, of course, in the case of the farmers, it's been devastating. Um, but they, among other things, I think it's actually hard for people to admit how big a mistake they made in voting for him. Right. So, you know, if you're a farmer who mm -hmm. said Trump is going to bring back the, you know, the real America, uh, gee, it's funny, all my neighbors are going bankrupt and I'm not doing too well, but you mm -hmm. cannot quite bring yourself to, to, to admit that you were snookered as badly as you were. And that's well, a, yeah. an important point. Sometimes if you buy tickets to Phantom of the Opera and you don't like it, you stand at the end anyway because you're like, well, this was expensive. Yeah. I, did a, I didn't like it, but yeah. oh, yes. You guys really tried hard. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was very glitzy. Yeah. Are there economists with, and I should write it down, I guess we're almost to time, or I don't want to go over, but we did start a tiny bit late. Um, are, there, are, are there economists with points of view that contradict yours, whom you respect or admire, or are they just wrong? Sell out your friends. That's my ad at the end. Not. I mean, there are different levels. There are there are no economists. None of the economists who think the tax cuts pay for themselves are people I respect. But we we can have real 
there are things, there are issues that are real disagreements. I mean, I, uh, Ben Bernanke and I disagree about the effectiveness of unconventional monetary policy. He thinks it works better than I do. I obviously take his views very seriously, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't. I think I'm right, but uh, God knows that you know. They, I, I could very well be wrong or something mm -hmm. like that. There are people. Um, there are. Uh, there. I'm, I'm, I, if I single somebody out, uh, everybody I, I don't, don't single out. But, but there are there are people. There are economists. Uh, who are self-identified Republicans, although some of them have, have af actually renounced that lately, but, uh, um, but who I think do really, really good work on things like urban development, uh, uh, transportation economics. So there's plenty of stuff. Uh, but on the core political issues, mm -hmm. the stuff that really matters, taxes, climate policy, uh, no, I'm afraid that there are the people I, you know, the people I disagree with are not actually, they're just not in the same business I'm in. They're not even trying to get the facts right. They're just trying to, to serve a political agenda and whatever, you know, some people would say that about me, but it ain't true. The fact right. is I'm actually trying to get it right. Right. Okay, great. Uh, okay, what lesson, this is a good question, what lesson did you learn from observing and talking with the Obama administration that the next Democratic president should know? Okay, don't listen to Wall Street. Um, mm. I was, it was the one place where I really felt that there was a problem was that the, that Wall Street guys had too much influence with Obama and company. Uh, and not, you know, not nefarious buyout, although it is a little disturbing how many Obama officials ended up going to work for Citigroup or whatever mm -hmm. afterwards, but, but more that, um, Finance industry types, they tend on, on average to be pretty smart, to be you know, sophisticated, kind of interesting to talk to. They have terrific tailors. And so, they're, um, and so they're very impressive in conversation and they gave terrible advice. And, uh, and the Obama administration was not nearly hard enough on the bankers. Uh, and so- um, I agree. And it was by, by the way, it was part of Obama's personality. He is that kind, you know, he, uh, very moderate, soft-spoken, articulate, you know, the, the, that plays with him. And mm -hmm. so we, we, there were meetings where people like Joe Stiglitz and me, you know, uh, uh, scrappy, frumpy professors uh, were arguing for a harder line on the banks and then there were people from Wall Street and guess who came across as more impressive in those <laughs> meetings, right? So, um, but, but Joe and I were right and the, You and have were a wrong. great tailor. Don't sell yourself okay. short. But, um, but the, so, so that's, I mean, I think of any future Democratic administration is gonna have to, to watch out because it, it, it's not gonna have a hard time. Uh, a Democrat's not gonna have a hard time understanding that, uh, that coal industry executives are not his friend or her friend. <laughs> right. But it may be a little bit harder to understand that sophisticated, socially liberal uh, bankers from New York are also not their friends. Right, okay, that's great. Okay, I'm gonna ask one last question. I think I'm gonna wrap it up. This is a good one. What will it take to increase worker wages again? Um, a lot of it has to do with power. So unions, I mean, rebuilding a union movement is a tremendously important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, America, where a quarter of the workforce was unionized, was a very different place. The, if you ask why are Scandinavian countries so much less unequal than we are, the fact that they have over 50% unionization matters a lot. And, and unions depend a lot on the political environment. If you make it easy for them to organize and make it illegal to, to, uh, to engage in, in suppression of union organizing efforts, uh, that makes a huge difference. Minimum wage can matter a lot as well. And you know, this is one of those cases where we have overwhelming evidence that up to a point, I mean, I, I, even I wouldn't call for a $30 an hour minimum wage, mm -hmm. but uh, it's overwhelming that, that raising the minimum wage to at least 13 and probably 15 is, is no problem at all, no job losses. And it, it not just, it's not just the minimum wage workers that sort of cascades up the scale. Um, just um, generally you want, political power to be on the side of workers in their bargaining with employers, uh, and that can make a huge difference. Great. I think this was great. 
I want to thank all of you all right. for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking to all of us. Well, thank you. This was wonderful. I want to wish you luck on your 1097th book tour that you've been on. Books are available in the lobby. It was a pleasure talking to you. Please come on my show again and talk for like an hour. Oh, I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.